Today on Bite Size, we're talking about Trojans, worms, and bombs, as we find out how does a virus work. To begin with, let's look at how a simple virus might work. Now, the virus is introduced to your system as an infected executable. For example, it could be a Trojan horse virus. Back in the 90s, it could have been that you boot from a floppy with an infected boot record. Now, this Trojan is either hidden in an application program that has been doctored by the virus creator, or it is the Trojan portion of a virus that is injected into a program file or the boot record by a worm portion. Once the program with the Trojan is activated, the virus is awakened. It installs itself in the operating system as a logic bomb, waiting for an opportunity to activate the worm or activate the destructive portion of itself. The logic bomb activates the worm portion whenever an acceptable host presents itself. Some viruses only replicate onto floppy disks or other mediums from the hard disk. Other viruses might infect any program that gets activated whether it's on a floppy disk, a CD-ROM, a USB stick, or the hard disk. Every time the worm copies itself onto another disk or program, it activates a built-in counter that keeps track of how many copies it has made. Now, I like to look at things from a nostalgic perspective where things were limited to disks, but of course, with the arrival of the internet and networks, it can even copy itself across networks to other computers where possible. Eventually, the destructive part of a virus may be activated, either by an event like running a program, a date occurring such as Friday the 13th, or by a certain number of replications. When the destructive portion activates, the virus may do something as innocuous as flashing a message on the screen or as damaging as erasing the entire hard disk. Now, I say it may be activated because some viruses are just pure worms. There's no dangerous part of them except the annoyance of their propagation. The word virus can send shivers down the spines of some people, but you have to remember a virus is just a computer program. The program doesn't run unless you let it run. This can be through a variety of methods, including web pages and JavaScript exploitation, but typically this is through a Trojan horse process. Once started, the virus acts like a memory resident program. Now, memory resident programs, also called TSRs, which stands for Terminate and Stay Resident Programs, live in memory, waiting to be activated. Now, the virus can live in several places. It can live in the master boot record, so when you switch your computer on or insert a disk or another storage medium. It can live in an executable file or a COM file, if you're going back to the 90s. Or it can live in a macro, which is quite common in email spread viruses. So, when I say Trojan horse, I mean a program that acts like a Trojan horse of Greek mythology. A malevolent program is hidden inside another, apparently useful program. While the useful program is running, the malevolent part does something nasty, like erasing your hard drive or directories. And this is where we get the term malware, short for malevolent or malicious software. A worm, on the other hand, is a program that replicates itself. It creates an image of itself either in a file, at a particular location on a disk, or across a network. And a logic bomb or a time bomb is the piece of code that does the destructive work and delivers the payload. So a virus is just a worm with a logic bomb or Trojan horse component. And although they can reside in the boot sector of a disk or storage medium, they have to do so through execution of a main program or macro in the first instance. Now, macro viruses are written in the macro language of an application. So you might have a Word document which, when opened, executes a VBA script that does some sort of malicious activity. Now, the first recorded virus originated in a computer shop in Lahore, Pakistan in 1986. It's called the Brain Virus, and when it infects the boot record, it makes a copy of the original boot record elsewhere on the disk and uses it to fool virus detection programs. If you run a program like Norton Antivirus and try and look at the boot record, you'll see a perfectly fine structure. And that's because Brain has intercepted Norton's request and fed it false data. Of course, it has to boot via the infected boot record to create this mirror, so if you boot up off a disk which is uninfected, then you can still detect the virus. 
Now, I'm a big fan of a YouTuber called Dano Oct1, and he goes through various viruses from the 80s and 90s. So, let's take a look at a few viruses from the past. Well, let's take a look at the virus and see what it actually does that caused such a media uproar. Once we restart with this disk in the drive, the computer will be infected. And we don't see anything really happen here. We don't get a non-system disk error message or anything like that. Everything appears to be frozen, nothing's really loading. So, today is March 6th. Michelangelo activates on March 6th. Let's see what all the hubbub is about. And there we go, the fatal error. No boot sector on hard disk. Because Michelangelo has overwritten the partition table, file allocation table, and basically anything that you need to find where your data is on the disk.